In this podcast episode, Andrew Huberman sits down with Alan Aragon, a highly respected figure in fitness and nutrition known for his evidence-based approach. Their discussion spans a wide range of topics related to nutrition, training, and body composition, providing clarity on many common myths and practical guidance grounded in scientific research. Aragon begins by addressing a pervasive myth in fitness nutrition, the idea that the body can only assimilate about 30 grams of protein per meal. He clarifies that this notion stems from a misunderstanding between general protein digestion and the specific muscle protein synthesis, MPS response. While earlier research suggested a plateau in MPS at around 20 to 30 grams of protein, more recent studies, including those with higher training volumes, have shown that muscle protein synthesis can increase with higher protein doses, sometimes up to 40 grams or more per meal. Importantly, Aragon emphasizes that total daily protein intake is far more critical than the precise timing or distribution of protein across meals. The so-called anabolic window post-exercise, once thought to be a narrow time frame requiring immediate protein intake, is now understood to be much broader, lasting up to 48 to 72 hours. As long as total daily protein needs are met, roughly 0.7 to 1 gram per pound of body weight, timing relative to workouts is flexible. This insight offers practical freedom for individuals with varying schedules, allowing them to consume protein when convenient without compromising muscle growth. The discussion then shifts to the popular topic of fasted training and its impact on fat loss. Aragon explains that while fasted exercise does increase fat oxidation during the workout itself, this effect does not translate into greater overall fat loss when total daily calories and macronutrients are controlled. In other words, the body compensates by adjusting fat burning later in the day, resulting in no significant difference in fat loss between fasted and fed training conditions. Aragon highlights a controlled study involving college-aged women performing moderate-intensity cardio, either fasted or fed, which showed no difference in fat loss or lean mass preservation over four weeks. This finding is supported by meta-analyses and underscores that personal preference should guide whether one trains fasted or fed. The key takeaway is that consistency in training and overall caloric balance matter far more than the timing of meals relative to exercise. Aragon elaborates on why protein is the cornerstone of nutrition for those aiming to improve body composition, whether the goal is fat loss, muscle gain, or maintenance. Protein directly supports lean body mass, particularly skeletal muscle, which is a major determinant of metabolic health and energy expenditure. Additionally, protein is the most satiating macronutrient, helping to control appetite and reduce overall calorie intake. Another important factor is the thermic effect of protein. The energy cost of digesting and metabolizing protein is higher than that of carbohydrates or fats. This means that a higher protein intake can modestly increase daily energy expenditure. Together, these factors make protein essential for preserving muscle during weight loss and supporting muscle growth during training, reinforcing the importance of prioritizing protein in the diet. The conversation turns to the quality of protein sources, a topic often fraught with debate. Aragon acknowledges that, gram for gram, animal proteins generally have a superior amino acid profile, including higher levels of essential amino acids and leucine, which is critical for muscle protein synthesis. However, he also points out that certain plant proteins, such as soy and pea protein, can perform comparably under the right conditions. Interestingly, recent studies comparing vegan and omnivorous diets with matched protein intakes, around 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, found no significant differences in muscle size or strength gains over 12 weeks of resistance training. This suggests that with adequate total protein and proper supplementation, plant-based diets can support muscle growth effectively. Nonetheless, Aragon notes that more research is needed, especially in highly trained athletes, and that individual preferences and dietary adherence play significant roles. Aragon addresses common concerns about carbohydrates, particularly starches, and their role in fat loss. He explains that when calories and protein are equated, carbohydrate intake does not inherently hinder fat loss. The body of research consistently shows no significant difference in fat loss 
between low-carb and higher-carb diets under controlled conditions. Fiber, meanwhile, is universally beneficial and should be consumed through fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. It supports digestive health, satiety, and metabolic function. Aragon cautions that whole grains can sometimes be a double-edged sword due to their calorie density and potential for overconsumption, especially when refined. Overall, carbohydrates remain a valuable fuel source, particularly for training performance and cognitive function. The topic of inflammation and its relationship to diet and fat loss is explored with nuance. Aragon suggests that much of the chronic low-grade inflammation seen in many individuals is linked to excess body fat, especially visceral fat. Therefore, diets that promote fat loss will inherently reduce inflammation. He also discusses the concept of hyperpalatability, foods engineered to be highly rewarding and easy to overconsume, typically combining refined carbohydrates, fats, salt, and sugar. Diets low in such foods, like those emphasizing whole meats, vegetables, and healthy fats, tend to reduce passive overeating and support better body composition and inflammation profiles. While some foods and nutrients, such as omega-3 fatty acids, have direct anti-inflammatory effects, the overall dietary pattern and fat loss remain paramount. Aragon provides a balanced perspective on added sugars and artificial sweeteners. He recommends limiting added sugars to about 10% of total daily calories, which translates to roughly 40 to 50 grams on a 2,000 calorie diet. While this may seem high to some, moderation and individual tolerance are key. Regarding artificial sweeteners, Aragon differentiates between types, noting that saccharin has shown some adverse effects on gut microbiota and glucose tolerance, but it is now rarely used. Other sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose, and stevia appear generally safe when consumed in typical amounts. He highlights that artificially sweetened beverages can be effective tools for weight management, especially for those who would otherwise consume sugary drinks and that fears about their health impacts are often overstated. Aragon discusses supplementation with a pragmatic lens, emphasizing that supplements should complement, not replace, a solid diet and lifestyle. Collagen supplementation, often overlooked, is supported by evidence showing benefits for skin, joints, and connective tissue health. Despite collagen's lower leucine content compared to whey, its unique amino acid profile and bioactive peptides may support tissue repair and maintenance, making it a worthwhile addition, especially for those who do not consume whole animal products nose to tail. He also endorses fish oil for its anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D3 for immune and bone health, often at doses around 4,000 IU daily, magnesium, preferably citrate form, creatine for muscle and cognitive benefits, and a quality multivitamin to cover micronutrient gaps. Vitamin C is also taken for its immune support and potential synergy with collagen. These supplements form a practical hierarchy for those with limited budgets seeking to optimize health and body composition. The discussion on alcohol highlights the complexity of its health effects. Aragon points out that moderate red wine consumption has been associated with some positive health outcomes, including cardiovascular benefits and even neurocognitive improvements though the literature is nuanced and sometimes conflicted. He stresses that alcohol's caloric content, potential to disrupt sleep, and its role in disinhibition leading to overeating are important considerations. Coffee and caffeine, on the other hand, are widely consumed and generally beneficial. Caffeine modestly increases fat oxidation and energy expenditure, and coffee consumption is linked to positive health outcomes across many domains, including longevity. The key caveat is to avoid caffeine too close to bedtime to prevent sleep disturbances. Aragon addresses the controversial topic of seed oils, which have been vilified in some nutrition circles. He argues that the scientific consensus does not support demonizing seed oils such as canola, soybean, or corn oil. In fact, canola oil has been shown in meta-analyses to improve blood lipid profiles, sometimes outperforming olive oil in lowering LDL cholesterol, partly due to its omega-3 content. He emphasizes that the broader dietary context matters more than the specific oil used. Seed oils are often consumed alongside highly processed hyperpalatable foods, which confounds their perceived negative effects. While extra virgin olive oil remains his personal favorite for taste and tradition, 
seed oils are generally safe and beneficial when consumed as part of a balanced diet. Butter and animal fats, while not inherently bad, tend to have more evidence linking them to adverse cardiovascular outcomes when consumed in excess. Aragon notes that, aside from differences in body weight and lean mass, there are few universal female-specific nutrition guidelines. The primary consideration is the menstrual cycle, which can influence appetite, energy levels, and cravings. He suggests that women may benefit from aligning diet breaks or higher calorie periods with their menstrual cycle to better accommodate these physiological changes without derailing progress. Regarding menopause, while some fat gain and lean mass loss are common during the transition, the magnitude is often modest. Symptoms such as hot flashes, sleep disturbances, and joint pain can make adherence to training and nutrition more challenging. Setting realistic expectations and focusing on consistent resistance training and adequate protein intake remain key strategies for women during this phase. One of the most encouraging topics covered is the possibility of simultaneous muscle gain and fat loss, known as body recomposition. Aragon explains that this phenomenon, once thought impossible, has been documented in multiple studies, especially in individuals new to training or returning after a layoff. Recomposition often occurs with a slight caloric surplus, around 10% above maintenance, combined with high protein intake, 1 to 1 broad 5 grams per pound of body weight, and consistent resistance training. He highlights research showing that adding extra protein calories on top of habitual intake can increase lean mass and sometimes reduce fat mass, possibly through increased satiety, thermogenesis, and non-exercise activity. This challenges the traditional view that muscle gain requires a large surplus and fat loss requires a deficit, offering a more nuanced approach for those seeking to improve body composition efficiently.